This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. If you have your Bibles today, I want to go to Revelation chapter 20. And the title of the message today is Tabernacles in the Millennial Reign. We're going to have some fun. I've got a lot of scriptures to go over. And we're going to try to do it in 48 minutes. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I teach in series. All right. Starting in verse 1. Now, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to want to get ahead of myself and wanting to preach instead of read. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the, old, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Everybody needs to stop there and say, let it be so, Lord. I tell you what, I'm, I want a ringside seat. Maybe kick him as he's going in. Okay. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. You need to underline that in your Bible, that he could not deceive the nations. How many know right now the nations are deceived? Okay. But after these things that he may be loose for a little while, and I saw thrones and them that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. <coughs> who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Underline that in your Bible. For a thousand years. How many is a thousand years? A thousand years, okay? But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection or such the second death hath no power. I like that, don't you? I'm going to get the first resurrection because death isn't going to be able to touch this guy anymore. When Jesus says, yo, I'm going to go. And I can't wait to see what that body's going to be like. And I guarantee you it won't hurt. And we'll have to worry about calories. Okay. Blessed is he and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death hath no power. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when a thousand years has expired, Satan will be released from prison and will go out and to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose name is, whose number is the, as the sands of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone while the beast and, where the beast and false prophets are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever. Lord, let it come quickly in Jesus' name. Now, I read that because we have a lot of people teaching that there's not going to be a millennial reign. And they're actually teaching that right now we're the millennial reign. If we are in the millennial reign and the devil is bound, I want a refund. Okay. I do not see what's going on. The nations are being deceived, just like he said the work of the enemy is. The UN is a puppet for the 
watchers that are returning and for Lucifer. That's one of the reasons when Jesus comes back, He's going to destroy those who were destroying the earth. And if you understood what they're doing with nanotech and everything else, they are literally destroying the earth. They want to depopulate the planet, except for their frozen chosen. And how many know God's going to stop that? In fact, if there's any clearing of the land, my Bible says that He's going to leave the wheat and pull up the tares. That's what you see in the book of Revelation. We need to understand that the appointed times of God in our last session, we discovered that the feasts belong to Almighty God. They are not Jewish feasts. They are God's feasts. They are appointed times for Him, and that they're all about Jesus, the works of Messiah, and His redemptive plan. One of the reasons, why do we have so many eschatological positions? 99% of the reason is they lost their understanding from a Jewish mindset. They disconnected themselves. They did like Constantine, let us have nothing in common with the Jews. Well, when you did that, you took the face of the clock, pulled the hands off, and now you're trying to prophesy, telling where we are on the clock. It's all about Jesus. When Jesus came the first time, he was Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. How many know the 40 days after he resurrected, fire fell from heaven? Well, I thought the Holy Spirit fell from heaven. Yeah, but he came with fire. We forget that. Because to be a priesthood... You need fire. Otherwise, you're just twiddling your thumbs. Imagine a Cohen trying to do what he's supposed to do without fire. And he could only use the fire that was given by God. So, we have the day of Pentecost. How I many know we're still there? The fall is coming. And the fall feasts are all about the conquering king coming back to take the nations back from himself. He's going to take them away from the watchers. He's going to take, take them away from the principalities and powers that were handed, the nations were handed to them at the Tower of Babel. One of the, one of the neatest phrases, verses in all of Revelation is when there's like, there's like this line drawn in the sand, Babylon is destroyed, and it says, now the nations have become the kingdom of our God and the kingdom of his Christ. Daddy got them back. That's what this is all about. The Sabbath and the feast take a, uh, the Sabbath and the feast take us out of sync with the world system in mystery Babylon. Now we got the Fall Brothers here this morning, so I'm going to brag on them. For those of you that do not have their DVD higher entities, you need to get it. This shameless plug right there. But one of the things that they did in, in, in that they, they talked about the Collins elite that were Christians and the government fighting the alien agenda. They brought up that uh, they began looking at the, the commandments and the feasts. And if they were looking at it to create a theocracy before Jesus returns, that will fail. But if they were looking at giving the body of Christ the antidote for the watchers, they can succeed. Now, if you're Collins elite, I'm not going to look for you, but I'd like to talk to one of your theologians one of these days because we got some talking to do. Um, when we properly understand the dynamic of Jesus giving the Torah to the children of Israel, how many know it was Jesus? There's a wonderful book out there uh, entitled, Who Ate with Abraham? And, and this Messianic uh, believer begins to show theologically that every appearance of Yahweh in the Old Testament was Jesus. It was a Christophanes. That's one of the reasons the secret behind why the Aleph Tav resides right next to Elohim in Genesis 1-1, because the olive tab, the beginning and the end, the power of the cross, the power of the covenant, is the only knowable aspect of God. Jesus is the only way to the Father in ancient biblical times and today. It is an absolute constant throughout Scripture. And so to, to, to get their minds not thinking like a Babylonian Egyptian slave... God said, meditate on my Torah day and night and you'll make your way prosperous. You'll begin learning the principles of walking in the kingdom. And those principles are still intact today. It's not about being culturally Jewish. It's about being biblically accurate. If God's, you know, it's, it's not about running around in zitzi and, and, and kippahs, although Moses never wore a kippah, Jesus never wore a kippah. Those came during the Middle Ages. In fact, the Pope has wore one longer than the Jews have. That's a whole can of worms that we can open up. But it's about returning to publicity. What God defines as sin will always be sin. It never changes. The cross did not change sin. The cross freed you from the power of sin. And if we don't understand that, we're really in trouble. We have a generation that has lost a prophecy. 
You know, I have my, my rounds that I do that I've done for years in churches of all sizes. And uh, when I wrote the Shiner Directive, all but two of them just quietly disinvited me. You know, teach me how to walk in the power of God. Teach me, teach me interesting things from the Bible. Just don't get into prophecy. I had actually had one come and say, you know, it, you, you, you can come, just don't, just don't mess with prophecy. Just don't deal with prophecy. And I'm thinking, what's the matter with you? I need a staff of 40 researchers just to keep up with how prophecy is unfolding in these days. You go back prior to the 90s, you'd see one or two things a year. Now we're seeing four or five things a day that are, that are setting up for Bible prophecy while the church is interested in the best life now. Now, one of the things that I had a mentor years ago, Dr. Doyle Vervel, and I remember him sitting down, we were talking about things, and I, this is way back when I was kind of stuck on stupid, really into the prosperity message, you know, and everything. Didn't have nothing, but I knew it was out there, you know, if I just got my formula right or something. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Mike, he said, the way I understand the Bible, if you're a believer, this is now your hell. This is, this is hell for you. Because after you leave this earth, it's all heaven on the other side. See, the best life now is the life to come. That's my hope in Jesus. But he said, if you're an unbeliever, this is your heaven. You want to talk about wanting a refund? If when you die, it's all downhill from there, then we are a people without hope. That's why they need Jesus. But we have a generation that has lost, that does not want to deal with prophecy at all. Revelation is one of the few books that says there's a blessing if you read it. It doesn't say that you have to understand it. You may not understand it until the 1,000th time that you've read it. All of a sudden, things will click. Why do you need to read it so much? Because as you watch the headlines, things will start clicking. Because it's familiar to you. It's kind of rewritten what you're looking for. Oh, I know what this is. Oh, this is setting up for the son of perdition. Oh, I can't believe they did that. You know, there's a reason why the United Nations is called the United Nations. In medieval times, what's, what's its abbreviation? UN. In medieval times, in medieval writings, Shakespearean type writings, the short for the devil was called the un. Everything is hidden in plain sight. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. I'm wanting to kick into Shiner Directive mode, and I've got somewhere else to go. Now we have songs, Behold what manner the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we might be called the B'nai Elohim, the son, children of God. I remember there was a Hosanna song about that. But like many scriptures, we just don't keep reading. You know, it says, you know, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. People like to put the period and try to take a razor and cut the rest of it from there. It says, well, this happens because you rejected knowledge. You rejected instruction. You rejected my ways. And I wonder if the church today isn't being destroyed because of their tenacity to say, lest this unhinge from the Old Testament, two-thirds of the Bible. I mean, A.W. Tozer takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. So if you just obey the last one-third, then you're one-third a Christian. Just saying. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Isn't it great just to get happy? I want to do that during praise and worship. Woo! Okay. But, but we know that he is revealed. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I don't have a clue what it is to have a glorified body. A body that arthritis can't touch, that Alzheimer's can't touch, that cancer can't touch, that never gets tired. That's immortal. That will live forever, never break down. In fact, I think when, when it comes at that moment, whether we are, we are translated, we are, the harpazo, the rapture happens where we get that new body, 
Or God simply pulls our file from the DNA of heaven and says, body be. And we get a new body. We're going to have an upgrade. Transhumanists always looking for upgrades. We're going to have an upgrade to your perfect self based upon your DNA. That's all God needs to have on file for you in heaven. The Bible says, you know, the numbers of your hair are counted and, and all this. And, and, but the truth of it is everything is in your DNA. Everything, what they call junk DNA, that's scientific jargon for we ain't got a clue what it is. But it's your personality, it's your spirit, man. Everything, they, they have discovered that on the outside of DNA, there is an antenna array picking up cosmic vibrations. In other words, you were wired from the Dion on up to fellowship and to hear the voice of God. I'm looking forward to that upgrade. Transhumanists can't give it to me. I'm not looking for a clunky Terminator body. I want to see what this body looks like, glorified. And when Jesus said, if you hadn't eaten all those Doritos, here's what you would have looked like <laughs> in the prime of your life. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's one of the problems with the church. If I'm not looking for his coming, I start living like he's never coming. But if I have this anticipation that he's coming, John says all of a sudden I start getting ready. Because I'm going to have to stand before him and give an account. There's still a judgment for believers. What you said and what you did. How much of it was the flesh and how much of it was spirit-led. And the older I get, you know, at, at, at my age now, I'm 60 is this like coming up really quick. And so you, you get this legacy mindset. Something switches from building to legacy and so when I get there, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, and not see the to-do list of everything I didn't get done because I was too busy doing what Mike Lake wanted. I mean, it, 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 it actually, uh, when the Apostle Paul talked about how the, the weight of all the congregations that he was an apostle over, bore, he, he could feel the weight of it. I feel the weight of everybody that listens to Biblical Life that does the podcasts, uh, listens, I, I feel the weight of that. Everyone reads the books. I can spiritually feel the weight of that as well as, Lord, let me live long enough that I get everything written that you need written. I want to teach everything that you want taught so that when I stand before you, I can be like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul ran to the executioner because he says, I have finished the race. I have fought the fight. And he knew there was not one thing left for him to do on planet earth and he was ready to go home. But we need to understand that as we, we begin moving toward and looking for his coming, he purifies himself. This word in the Greek is hagnizo, which means to cleanse from defilement, which is really what 1 John is all about. In fact, um, when you read 1 John, it's, it's one of these things where uh, the apostle of love is really blunt. You say you know him, you don't do this, you're a liar. How's that for love? John, John in his old age, after he saw the book of Revelation and had to pen it, he said, I'm going to give some tough love, you know. He needed to for our sake. But we, if, if I'm going to cleanse myself from some 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 and 6, just keep on reading. He's going to share with us what we have to cleanse ourselves of. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Well, I thought the law was done away with. Didn't he get Paul's memo? This was written 30 years after the death of the Apostle Paul. One of the last books penned in the New Testament. Sin is still the transgression of the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him was no sin. Whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So one of the things I need to ask, those that teach that sin has been done away with, and because of grace we can do anything that we want to do, 
Do they know him? Or do they know another Jesus? Well, it's interesting about this word sin in the original text, because he could have used a lot of, he could have used antinomia, which is iniquity, which he already used previous in the verse, that this, this standing against God's law, like the man of lawlessness, is sin. But he used a specific word, hamartia, in the Greek, which means to miss the mark. Now, why is that? Why, why did this Jewish boy, why is he worried about your marksmanship? If you understand what Torah means, now we culturally translate it law, but unfortunately that is a mistranslation because culture does not transliterate when you're going from Hebrew to English. You begin extrapolating out of your own culture rather than reading the culture of the time. That's one of the, the paradoxes of biblical interpretation. You have, to, you have to learn how to hear with the ears of those that originally heard it. Otherwise, you're not going to get the full impact of what was said. Now, this is the definition of Torah. The Hebrew word Torah is derived from a root that was used in the realm of archery. Yair uh, means the, to, to shoot an arrow to, in order to hit the mark. The mark or target, of course, was the object in which the archer was aiming. Consequently, Torah... One of the nouns derived from this root is therefore the arrow aimed at the mark. The target is truth about God and how one relates to Him. The Torah is therefore, in a strict sense, instruction designed to teach us about the truth of God. Torah means direction, teaching, instruction, and doctrine. When we say the word Torah, it literally means the loving instruction of the Father. Even Moody's theological word book of the Old Testament defines it as such. So when, when the Apostle Paul said, we're not under the loving instruction of the Father, how moronic does that sound? He was referring to something else that we have missed because we have, we have not taken the time to understand history, the culture, the dynamic of what the Shemai Pharisees had done in creating a system that them being the super Jews, they live by the letter of the law. The school of Hillel was by the spirit of the law. That they were telling Gentiles, no, no, you can't even believe in Messiah until you first become Jewish. And therefore you're saved by circumcision. That's the works of the law that they had created. And Paul said, listen, if you're going to trust in that system, no Jew was underneath that system. Did a Jew get circumcised because they wanted to be saved? No, they got circumcised because they were a Jew. Well, does that mean we have to be circumcised? Read Acts 15. Circumcision of the heart is a greater circumcision. Even when God originally had them all get circumcised, they rebelled against Him and Almighty God said, Oh! I wish I'd have circumcised your hearts. Even back then, he was looking for the other side of the cross, longing for it. God is not calling us to be culturally Jewish. In fact, modern Judaism is a pale shadow from what it was in the days of Jesus and the apostles. And there is a vast difference between rabbinical Judaism and biblical Judaism. Hillel, I think, would look at modern Judaism and, and, and really be confused. Because they replaced Moses. Not only did they reject Jesus, they rejected Moses and replaced him with Talmud. Jesus called him on it. Here's the reason you're going to reject me. You wouldn't hear Moses. Why do you pray every day for our Jewish brethren that they would return to Moses and set the Talmud down and the, and the Kabbalah down and the, and the Midrash down, the Mishnah down, and just go back to the scriptures that you have so diligently preserved all these years by the anointing of God and by the grace of God. Go back to the holy scriptures and you will find Messiah in them. You will find the kingdom in them. You'll find the ways of God in them. When we look at eschatological times or eschatological views, how many know there's no more positions than Carter has liver pills? We have the premillennial, 
pre-tribulational view, which is very prominent in a lot of evangelical circles. That means we have our Willy Wonka golden ticket. We never have to go through anything. We're out of here for the devil shows up. Okay? Then we have the pre-millennial, post-tribulational view. That means I'm holding my ground all the way to the very end. Then we have the evangelical post-millennial. That means I'm holding out to the end. But then we have the premillennial, pre-tribulational, partial rapture view. A lot of times you'll hear it called, are you a first loader? <laughs> well, as far as I can interpret scripture, there's only one train coming, baby. <laughs> All right. We also have what I believe is pre-wrath. I'm a pre-wrathian, okay? Uh, but I do believe the way that I view it with the feasts, I think we get out of here 10 days for the real prophecy hits the fan and Jesus comes back and koshers the planet. Just enough time for a Jewish wedding feast. I'm looking forward to that. But I think some of the problems that we're dealing with is something called Armenianism. Or not Armenianism, amillennialism. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot. Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.